Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. If you were on social media over the weekend, you probably saw this video. It was shot Friday afternoon on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It seemed to show a group of teenage boys taunting an elderly American Indian man who was holding a drum. The young men had come to Washington from a Catholic school in Kentucky to demonstrate in the March for Life. Some of them wore Make America Great Again hats. They seem menacing. Within hours, the video is being replayed by virtually every news outlet in America. Here's what you may have seen. Well, the American Indian man with the drum you just saw is called Nathan Phillips, and he described the young men he encountered, the ones in the hats, as aggressive and threatening, essentially shock troops for Donald Trump. Watch. I heard them saying, build that wall, build that wall. You know, this is indigenous lands. You know, we're not supposed to have walls here. We never did. Well, it's hard to remember the last time the great American meme machine produced a clearer contrast between good and evil. It was essentially an entire morality play shrunk down to four minutes for Facebook. On the one side, you had a noble tribal elder, weather-beaten, calm, and wise. He looked like a living icon. You could imagine a single tear sliding slowly down his cheek at the senselessness of it all. And on the other side, you had a pack of heedless, sneering young men from the South drunk on racism and white privilege. The irony was overwhelming. The indigenous man's land had been stolen by the ancestors of these boys in MAGA hats, and yet they dared to lecture him about walls designed to keep people who look very much like him out of what they were calling their country. It was infuriating to a lot of people. At the same time, it was also strangely comforting to those who watched it from Brooklyn and L.A. The people who run this country have long suspected that middle America is a hive of nativist bigotry, and now they had proof of that. It was a cause for a celebration of outrage, because there's nothing quite as satisfying as having your own biases confirmed. But did the video really describe what happened? That should have been the first question that journalists asked. Checking facts and adding context is what journalists are paid to do. It's in the first line of the job description. And yet, amazingly, almost nobody in the American media did that. And that's a shame, because there was a lot to check. The full video of what happened on Friday in Washington is well over an hour long. The four minutes that made Twitter don't tell the story, but instead distort the story. A longer look shows that the boys from Covington Catholic in Kentucky were not a roving mob looking for a fight. They were, in fact, and it shows it on the tape, standing in place waiting to be picked up by a bus. As they waited there, members of a group called the Black Hebrew Israelites, that's a black supremacist organization, began taunting them with racial epithets. And then Nathan Phillips, the now famous American Indian activist, approached them, pounding on his drum. Now, the footage seems to suggest that the boys were unsure of whether Phillips was hostile or taking their side against the black Hebrew Israelites. But in any case, there is no evidence at all that anybody said, build a wall. Here's a selection of what didn't make social media. This child molesting and the priest right there. Right. Let's make America great again. A bunch of child molesting. Look at all these dusty crackers with that racist garbage on. Look at these dirty crackers. Bunch of future school shooters. That's right. A bunch of in incest babies. A bunch of babies made out of incest. The biggest terrorist on the face of this earth is the pale face man, woman, and child. Hmm. So what really happened on Friday? Well, you can watch for yourself and decide. There's plenty of video out there of it, and some of it is fascinating and revealing. But what we know for certain at this point is that our cultural leaders are, in effect, bigots, and they understand the reality on the basis of stereotypes. When the facts don't conform to what they think they know, they ignore the facts. They see this country not as a group of people or of citizens, but as a collection of groups. And some of those groups, they are convinced, are morally inferior to other groups. They know that's true. They say it out loud. And that belief shapes almost all of their perceptions of the world. It's not surprising, then, that when a group of pro-life Catholic kids who look like lacrosse players and live in Kentucky are accused of wrongdoing, the media don't pause for a moment before casting judgment. 
Maggie Haberman of the New York Times suggested the boys needed to be expelled from school. Anna Navarro of CNN called the boys racists and ass wipes, and then went after their teachers and their parents. Others called for violence against them. CNN legal analyst Bakari Sellers suggested one of the boys should be, quote, punched in the face. Former CNN contributor Reza Aslan agreed. Aslan asked on Twitter this, have you ever seen a more punchable face than this kid's? Longtime CNN contributor Kathy Griffin seemed to encourage a mob to rise up and hurt these boys. Quote, name these kids. I want names. Shame them. If you think these efforts wouldn't dox you in a heartbeat, think again. Then she repeated her demand again later. Quote, names, please, and stories from people who can identify them and vouch for their identity. Thank you. Hollywood film producer Jack Morrissey tweeted that he wanted the boys killed. Quote, MAGA kids go screaming hats first into the wood chipper. And then he paired that with a graphic photo. Actor Patton Oswalt linked to personal information about one of the boys in case anyone wanted to get started on that project. Meanwhile, Twitter, which claims to have a policy against encouraging violence, stood by silently as all of this happened. But in case you think the response was entirely from the left, you should know that the abuse was bipartisan. It wasn't just left versus right. It was the people in power attacking those below them as a group. Plenty of Republicans in Washington were happy to savage the Covington kids, probably to inoculate themselves from charges of improper thought. Bill Kristol asked his Twitter followers to consider, quote, the contrast between the calm dignity and quiet strength of Mr. Phillips and the behavior of MAGA brats who have absorbed the spirit of Trumpism. And then when the actual facts emerged, Kristol quietly deleted his tweet. He never apologized, of course. He hasn't apologized for the Iraq war either. There's no need. People keep giving him money. National Review, meanwhile, ran a story entitled, The Covington Students Might As Well Have Spit on the Cross. That story has since been pulled, too, but not before the author admitted he never even bothered to watch all of the videos. He knew what he knew, and that was enough. What's so interesting about the coverage of Friday's videos was how much of it mentioned something called privilege. Alex Kranz, who's an editor at Gizmodo, for example, wrote this. From elementary school through college, I went to school with sheltered upper-middle-class white boys who could devastate with a smirk a facial gesture that weaponized their privilege. Infuriatingly, you can't fight that effing smirk with a punch or words. We saw that as Trump smirked his way through the election, and we'll see it as that boy from Kentucky's friends, family, and school protect him. I effing hate that smirk. It says, I'm richer, I'm white, and I'm a guy. What's so fascinating about all of these attacks is how inverted they are. These are high school kids from Kentucky. Do they really have more privilege than Alex Kranz from Gizmodo? Probably not. In fact, probably much less. They're far less privileged, in fact, than virtually everyone who has called for them to be destroyed on the basis that they have too much privilege. Consider Kara Swisher, for example. She's an opinion columnist of the New York Times. Swisher went to Princeton Day School and then Georgetown and then got a graduate degree at Columbia. She has become rich and famous in the meantime by toadying for billionaire tech CEOs. She's their handmaiden. Nobody considers her very talented, and that she's somehow highly influential in our society. Is she more privileged than the boys of Covington Catholic in Kentucky? Of course she is. Maybe that's why she feels the needs to call them Nazis, which she did repeatedly. So what's actually going on here? Well, it's not really about race. In fact, most of the stories about race aren't really about race. And this is no different. This story is about the people in power protecting their power and justifying their power by destroying and mocking those who are weaker than they are. Why? Simple. Our leaders have not improved the lives of most people in America. They can't admit that because it would discredit them. So instead, they attack the very people they have failed. The problem, they'll tell us, with Kentucky isn't that bad policies have hurt the people who live there. It's that the people who live there are immoral because they're bigots. They deserve their poverty and their opioid addiction. They deserve to die younger. That's what our leaders tell themselves, and now that's what they're telling us. Just remember, they're lying when they do.